All right, ladies and gentlemen, entrepreneur, aviator, astronaut, Jared Isaacman, and Dr. Cyan Proctor. Thank you. Brooke, it's so good to be up here on the stage with you and this amazing occasion. Um, how do you feel? You've done so much and in not that much time, you know? Under 40 years. <laughs> yeah, I've racked up a lot of miles of week. <laughs> this is uh, this is incredible. What a what an honor it has on me. I uh, don't feel worthy. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing to be here. And great to be here with you. Yeah, you know, I I, I love when you say you know things like um, you don't feel worthy, but your leadership and your leadership style, when you think about that, is all about decisions and the choices you've made. And, and when I think about you and your story, you, those choices started really early. I mean, at 12, 13, you made probably the most important choice because you had to choose between going to space camp or aviation challenge camp, both at the same location, but you chose aviation over space camp. Why? Do you remember why? Yeah, so <clears throat> first of all, rewind the clock even earlier, probably five years old, and it's like, Two movies in my life led me in this direction, right? First, Top Gun. Yeah. We all get this. And then the other was Space Camp, right? So you watch this movie and it's like, wait, all I have to do is go to Space Camp and then there's a good chance this robot's gonna launch me into orbit. <laughs> so I uh, went to Space Camp, like you said, at, at 12, 13, but I did choose the aviation challenge side. And I think that was just realizing at that point that, you know, aviation is it is obtainable? Like this is something that can be part of my life, but uh, but obviously spaceflight is, you know, better chance of getting struck by lightning. So that's why I went to the aviation challenge side. It's an incredible experience. So did you think that um, you wanted to be a pilot and flying was going to be a part of your life at that age? Absolutely. I mean, I built my first computer so I could play Falcon 3.0. I mean, this is uh, I don't know how you can like you watch Top Gun as a kid and you're like that is probably one of the coolest things you can you can do in life and. Um, and yeah, I mean, I went up on this uh, business track at a, at a pretty young age at, at 16. And, um, you know, that kind of distracted me a little bit from my aviation interest for some period of time. But after a couple of years of waking up on my keyboard, I was like, I need something more in my life and went right back to aviation. And, you know, 20 years later, I never, never slowed down with it. Yeah. Well, you know, you have this, um, I can do this perspective that came early. Because at 16, most of us would be like, I can go off and start my own company, I can do this. And then if you look at the things that you've done, yeah, you know, like you're saying, in your 20s you woke up and you're like, I need to do, I need to go back to aviation. But you didn't just go back to aviation, you're like, I'm gonna become a fighter pilot, I'm gonna become a formation fighter pilot, one of the toughest things to do. And, and with this, I can do this perspective, um, do you ever, did you ever, did you ever have doubts? Like, oh no, there's no way I can do that. Uh, because you you go forward with such clarity. Yeah. Well, um, maybe maybe we didn't all leave high school at 16, but uh, but I think most of us hated high school, and that at least that was that was my motivating factor. Um, so I had a lot of older brothers and sisters, and I I wasn't I wasn't thrilled with having to raise my hand and go use the bathroom in high school. So I left and wanted to do something else. But I do think that. Um, you know, with me, like I, I, you know, you're always trying to seek out like that next greatest uh, challenge. You know, if it, especially me, I've been super lucky in life to be able to go on a number of interesting challenges, from starting a business when I was 16 to where my aviation career has taken me, and and certainly like once you once you start flying, it's like what's the next greatest challenge? Will you, you know, you're flying ex-military aircraft, then you do formation flying, and that in itself could have real, you know, uh, you know, commercial value. Which is what ultimately pivoted towards towards Draken, where we were supporting the um, the Department of Defense. And uh, you know, you keep looking for the next greatest challenge. I mean, as you know, because we we did it. Um, you know, being able to operate a spacecraft in one that is maybe one the pinnacle for uh, for an aviation career. So, I always keep kind of strive for the next big opportunity. Um, when I think about opportunity and taking challenges and stuff, I think about support. Um, you had the support of your family and your wife Monica who is here in the audience and um, But not just that but the people around you that video showed that you surround yourself 
with people who support you and are willing to go on this journey. How important has that been a narrative in your life to, um, it, to have support and be able to do these grand challenges as a result of that? Yeah, I, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely imperative. Um, so, I mean, I'm very lucky. My, my wife and I have been together for a very long time, so she's been there even before my aviation career uh, ever began, so every step along the way. And I um, was able to make a pretty, you know, compelling argument that, look, going to space is probably safer than air show flying, so if anything, I'm actually reducing my risk profile over there. Uh, <laughs> she was totally, totally on board with it. But, I mean, even beyond just family support, like you said, been surrounded by some incredible individuals, and, uh, and without them, never would have achieved anywhere close to the heights that I have in, from a business perspective or throughout the aviation career. And I mean, as you know, I could, you know, when it comes to our mission in space, I mean, we, we benefited from the, the hard work for 20 years of 10,000 incredible people at SpaceX, thousands of people before that at NASA that, you know, we were able to even make this remotely possible for commercial machine orbit. So uh, it takes a lot of people. Well, you know, when I think about Inspiration for and our mission. Um, and did you just wake up one day and say, I'm, I'm going to go to space? You know, you turn to Monica and you're like, hey, you know, I, this is something that I want to do. And uh, and then figure out that path forward. Was oh, was this something that was in the back of your mind ever since going to space camp? No, there was like zero chance this was going to happen, I thought. Like, totally. Uh, I mean, talking about the stars aligning for something like this to even be remotely possible. Again, it starts with you know, Elon and, and, you know, thousands of visionaries at, at SpaceX who embarked on this journey 20 years ago and pioneered things like reusable rocket technology or a mission like we went on was, would not have been even remotely possible. But um, where it really began outside of space camp, because maybe that planet some feeds, was uh, 2008 after my first uh, kind of around the world record flight, I got an invitation to go to Baikonur, Kazakhstan, uh, see the Soyuz, see, see the Soyuz launch. Um, uh, you know, Richard Garriott's mission, a friend, friend of both of ours. Um, and uh, it was kind of the early days of the commercial space industry. And that was where there were some of the first conversations, um, actually it was shortly thereafter, about maybe having an opportunity to, to fly Dragon. And this is 0809, I mean, you know, 12 years later before, before Dragon was operational. Um, so it took a little bit of time to get there. I, I actually put it completely in the back of my mind, forgot about it entirely, <clears> thinking, <throat> well, maybe someday, but probably not likely. And then in, uh, you know, in 20, late 2020, before even Crew-1 launched, before NASA even resumed operational flights from the U.S., uh, the opportunity came with SpaceX. I had no idea that we were going to be the first, but uh, as soon as I found that out, um, you know, then, uh, then it, it became all about assembly and an incredible crew like yourself um, and uh, making sure that we had a bigger cause than just the mission itself, like raising a quarter of a billion plus for, for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and make sure that you know, we got this one right for all the other cool missions to follow. Well, you know, um, uh, two questions come to mind with that. One is when you met up with SpaceX in 2020, was it you that initiated the idea of going and doing the first all civilian mission? Yeah, I mean, I, I basically just reminded them that periodically I've been knocking on the door. Uh, and, you know, let me know when, let me know when we're, the world's ready for commercial space. You know, first time we're not going to have world superpower sending people to orbit. So it's got to happen, right? I mean, at some point, you know, this has got to, we've got to open up this last great unexplored frontier. Uh, but I just assumed it was going to be like, well, this is perfect. I'll talk to you in 10 years. Yeah. I didn't know that it was like, you know. A year couple, later. Not even a year later, a couple yeah. weeks later. Like we, we literally, Inspiration4 was born. A couple weeks after that conversation, and then less than a year from that point, we're in orbit together. And, and that's pretty amazing. Um, when you think about this and the whole idea of going to space, and, and you're approaching SpaceX with this idea of the first, you know, commercial launch. Why not take your buddies? I mean, because I, I, I can't even imagine a conversation with Monica where you're like, yeah, I'm going to go to space, but I'm also going to take random people to space with me, not people who I know and already trust. Because with space, trust is an important part of being becoming a crew. And so you took the, you really, made the decision to, to some extent, roll the dice and, and went with people you didn't know. I think it's, uh, it was entirely about doing the right thing. I mean, I'm uh, you know complete believer, as I know we are in uh, SpaceX's incredible, extraordinary vision to make life multi-planetary. And um, 
I mean, what an outrageous vision, you know, to, uh, to go out and, and potentially colonize Mars at some point in time. We're talking about something of, you know, several orders of magnitude greater than even the Manhattan Project, right? And, uh, and even with a, you know, a leader behind it, you know, who has more resources than any other human being in the world, it's gonna take so much more than that, like 10X that, right? And you have to be like really aware of how big of a, and you know, and, you know, how big of a challenge this is that's being taken on right now. It's gonna take support from people all over the world. Like we don't need, you know, the, 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 uh, li you know, the, the billionaire image in space and going up with your, your drinking buddies. That's not what the, the world needs. They already think that it's like this binary choice of like, you know, this planet's done for, time to move on to, uh, to Mars, or completely forget about making progress for this exciting world we all want to live in and just deal with all of the pain and hardship that's on this, that's on this planet today, which has been there, you know, since the beginning of, of human time. Like we have to, we have to be able to do both, right? Like we, we have to try and address some of the real problems we have here on Earth, and that's why St. Jude was such a, an important part of our mission, something that absolutely has nothing to do with space, but has an incredible vision in its own right of, of no child should die in the dawn of light. And we've got to build for that exciting Star Wars future that we all, all dream to live in for, for tomorrow. And if you recognize that, then you put a lot of thought into the people that are going to go on this mission, you know, how they can inspire their own audience, the, the charitable component to the mission, what you're setting out to accomplish, so that SpaceX does have the opportunity to continue to press forward and, and achieve their incredible vision. When you um, met with, how about that? That's so amazing. I just want to say. One of the things, I mean, it wasn't just about doing a fundraiser for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. It was also about giving these kids hope for a for future. And you chose to fly a childhood cancer survivor as a result of that. Um, and so can you kind of walk us through that uh, part of this, of not just saying I'm gonna go do a fundraiser, but you know, let's also inspire along the way. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, when we reached out to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, I mean, this was, this was before any mission was announced, before people even knew that commercial space was coming. I mean, you know, you call a, a children's hospital and say we have this, you know, idea to raise a lot of funds and it's gonna involve sending people into space. Like, you'd think you'd, you'd hear a dial tone, like it just, you know. I, I was so impressed with how St. Jude mobilized so many resources inside the organization before, again, any of this was ever announced. They got 100% behind it. Um, from, got behind the fundraising effort, uh, which obviously you know became a really large dollar amount, but also that we wanted to take one of their employees up. We wanted a, a frontline healthcare worker, and uh, and they immediately brought uh, Haley Arsenal to the table. And what a well, you know, what, a, what an amazing crew member is that? I mean, first, you couldn't ask for a better medical officer, uh, you know, to actually fulfill her responsibilities as a, an astronaut, but a childhood cancer survivor, you know, you know, ten years old in the fight of her life, all she wants to do is grow up. Uh, and be a physician assistant and help others, other children that are in the same fight. Um, and obviously she became the, the youngest American to go into space, which is still, still stands today. Uh, first childhood cancer survivor, first with a prosthesis. And I think she's inspired so many people, just as you have on that mission, to, to look up and, and, and maybe want to do things in life that they never thought were possible. Maybe have absolutely nothing to do with space, but you know, teaches people to overcome adversity and never give up and just awesome human being. Like I'm super lucky to have such an incredible crew on inspiration for me. Well, you know, speaking of that, uh, the other two seats were contests. Mm -hmm. And so that means that you have uh, the chance of getting somebody, a random person that you really might not like and <laughs> want to go to space with you. Did that thought ever occur to you that you might end up with somebody who you're just like, wow, how am I ever going to get three days through three days in space with this person? Well, I mean, I also knew that, you know, SpaceX has a, you know, has some screening criteria. They, unlike, you know, throughout everyone who's gone into orbit up till now, you know, health and psychological screening has been like, how do I take a million candidates and narrow it down to, you know, a handful of SpaceX mindset is the exact opposite of that, which is like, how do we get more people into space? But I also knew that they were, there was going to be a process they were going to go through and make sure that anyone who was going to go up was going to be, you know, really awesome contributor. And, um, and uh, I had no doubt we were going to, we were going to get along really well. So. Ooh, made the cut. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I think about uh, the, the Zoom call, so Jared, I get on a Zoom. I didn't know that I'd won the prosperity seat. 
and I see you there, and you immediately congratulate me on being selected. But the next thing that you said to me kind of still blows me away is that you said, I also want you to be my mission pilot. And, and in my mind, I was thinking, does he know I've only flown a Cessna 172? Um, and, but you had the confidence in, in thinking that this is a person that I want to be in that right seat next to me. Um, and so can you share, like, what were you thinking there in that decision? Well, I already knew your background at that point in time. And then, for, you know, for those not familiar with Dr. Proctor here, call, call sign Leo, um, you, you know, Dr. Proctor has done, you know, everything in life you could to be, to be set up for, uh, to be an, an astronaut. I mean, PhD, geoscientist, professor, you know, scuba diver, major in the Civil, Civil Air Force, analog astronaut, NASA runner-up in, in 2009. I knew all of this, you know, before we ever had that conversation and a pilot, so there's no question that you were, you were going to be the mission pilot. Also, the first black female pilot of a spacecraft, which is pretty, pretty damn extraordinary. <laughs> you realize just how much you change people's lives. And that's one of the reasons why you're being recognized here, because you're so humble in the things that you do. But what I want to share with you that a lot of people might not know just listening to our conversation is that you're one of the funniest people I know. And, and he's right. got this amazing sense of humor. <laughs> and, and we would be training. And one of the things about going to SpaceX and, and we're in the sim and we're doing all these things, but you made us feel so comfortable and so like at ease because of your humor. So was stand-up comedian ever in the possible <laughs> realm of career choices? No, wasn't. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I did think it was a good way to, you know, kind of, you know, disarm everyone around the whole flying on a controlled explosion with 17,500 miles an hour. It's like this, kind of find a way to lighten this up a little bit, you know? Well, I think it's always been a part of your personality and also probably, Monica would probably know, like just uh, having that wit and humor. When we were in the spacecraft, you brought along a friend. None of us knew that this friend was gonna be there. Do you wanna describe um, what you unleashed in the Dragon capsule while we were on orbit? Uh, it's a xenomorph for those that have seen the aliens, great movie. Yeah. Anyway, my kids play with it now. And, and, but just that whole idea of like who you are and thinking of ways not only to inspire but also to lighten the mood and saying like, okay, everything is going to be okay. Um, when I think about your future, most people would have been like a one and done when it comes to space. Like, okay, I did this, I achieved it. But you decided that you weren't, you were already done. You're gonna go back not just once, but three times, and then take on the most challenging thing that you could do in space, which is an EDA. Um, what, what is your thinking behind taking on that kind of challenge? I think, again, it just comes back to being a real true believer in SpaceX's vision. I think that um, I just agree with everything, that their entire thought process and why 10,000 amazing people come to work every day. The world is a more interesting place when you can journey among the stars. You know, there are answers to, you know, questions that we've been asking ourselves since the beginning of humankind. It's out there. Not to mention we have a lot of, we have a lot of eggs in one basket here. It didn't work out well for the dinosaurs. So when we came back from Inspiration4, we went to Starbase, Texas, and, and Elon was there, and the, the concept of what, you know, this private space program would be at Polaris was laid out. A series of tests and developmental missions, you know, that will begin with Polaris Dawn and will end with Starship, you know, the first fully reusable N10 vehicle that could very well be the, you know, the, the 737 of human spaceflight and help us, you know, unlock some of the mysteries of our solar system, of our universe, and, and make life multi-planetary. And so it was incredibly appealing. Like, it was like, this is, this is awesome. This is a very, very small way to contribute to the, to the history SpaceX is making. We got some awesome objectives. Polaris Dawn will launch, uh, you know, hopefully in April of uh, 2024. We've been training for over two years. It'll be the highest Earth orbit ever flown. We'll go farther away from the Earth than, uh, than anyone's been since the last time we walked on the moon more than 50 years ago. We uh, will descend down a little bit, vent the entire vehicle down to vacuum, and we'll do an EVA, and the first new EVA spacesuit built in four years. Um, and why? Because if you're gonna have thousands of people on the moon or Mars someday, you're gonna probably wanna get outside your, your habitat or your spaceship, and you're gonna wanna explore and construct, and you're gonna need suits that don't cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. We'll communicate over laser links, so we'll communicate over the Starlink constellation, 
Uh, because someday you're going to have hundreds or thousands of, of starships in low Earth orbit and cislunar orbit, and you're going to need to rely on communication methods more than just you know the, the legacy ground stations and, um, and TDRS satellites. And uh, we've got five days of science and research. So we'll get that mission done, Polaris 2. Might very well be a rendezvous and boost of Hubble, which would be awesome to keep that exploration asset going. And so the third mission, probably many years from now, will we'll take Starship on its uh, shakedown cruise, which is pretty awesome with thinking about it. Okay, one last question. Moon or Mars? If you could put boots on one of the surfaces, which one do you choose and why? It's got to be Mars, because then everybody will start thinking about the next planet we got to get to. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.